Uh, my name is Pastor Jason. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm excited to go through uh, Galatians with you. So if you have a Bible, you want to pre-select, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, and um, actually also Matthew chapter 23. So if you're like a person, you like to you know, stick your finger in a place and then come to it later, Matthew chapter 23 and Galatians 4 is where we're going to be um, this morning. But I have a question for you. Um, I, I think it's, it's a little bit rhetorical because I, I, I feel like I, we already all know the answer. But when you hear um, somebody is religious, does that have a positive or a negative connotation to you? Religious. Does that sound like, hey, I know this religious person? Positive or negative? Just say it. Negative. Some positive. Both. A little bit. Kind of depends, right? If somebody says, oh, you're a very religious person... Depending on who that person is, it could be like, oh, they, they just don't know the right word to say that I have a relationship with God. Or like, wow, you're a really religious person and it's an insult, <laughs> right? Like there's something a little bit insulting about that sometimes. What are the, what, what's the connotation though that comes along with that? What's the baggage that comes with that word maybe of being religious? What do you think? Say it. High expectation. Higher expectations. Anybody else? Strict, judgmental, pious, ritualistic, yeah, legalistic, right? Anybody say that? So those are the kind of the dynamics a lot of times that come along with that. And the, and the honest truth is a lot of those are reasons why people don't want to come in here, right? Like that's... That's a reason that people don't necessarily want to come to church, not just in here, but in church in general. It's like, those people are so judgmental. Those people are so self-righteous. Those people are so legalistic. Those people, right? And we don't want to be those people. But the truth is, it, I believe it's a natural bent for people to be all of those things, right? Like, that's religion. That's a fleshly way to relate to God what we think might be God or the spiritual desires that we have in our life or whatever. I was talking with somebody in between service and we were talking about how, um, he was talking about some documentary um, about Scientology, I think it was. And just like all of the legalistic, all the rules, all the things that you have to do and all these different other religions and really so many things that you have to do. And that's what a lot of times people put on Christianity is like all the things that I can't do and all the things that I have to do. And yet that's not why Jesus came. And that's hopefully not why you came. Hopefully my goal today is that you will walk away more free. Stronger in liberty than you are in some outward religion. So this morning we're going to talk about the conflict and the clues of legalism. So the conflict and the clues of legalism. The Apostle Paul has some strong words, as we've already seen through Galatians. And we're going to look at some of the, the strongest things that Jesus ever said to any group of people or about any group of people were the religious people. So we're going to look at that in Matthew 23 as well a little bit. So last week, we kind of built the backdrop. If you missed last week, for whatever reason, 4th of July weekend and all that, um, it's one of the few times I will say, like, it really might be helpful to go back and listen. It'll be on the website. It's on the app. Little plug. Um, website's getting redone, just saying. So we're looking forward to that, it's, right? Like a little upgrade, a little update. But the message will be there. And the reason why the message is important, I think, specifically, because we talked about a really broad philosophical idea of my way and God's way, the fleshly way and the spiritual way. And, and the dynamic is that it's different, that my way doesn't bring good fruit, spiritual fruit, and God's way does bring spiritual fruit. And the picture that we looked at was in Galatians, Paul refers to Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. Now, he doesn't use their names here. He uses um, some descriptions of them, but I wanted to give you the background for this description that Paul is going to give. So we talked about 
how um, Abraham and Sarah were promised a child. They weren't able to have a child for many years, and so eventually Sarah came up with a plan to have Abraham sleep with her maidservant, Hagar. Um, that's a horrible idea, right? And Abraham goes along with it, and then there's conflict. And we're going to see that Paul uses this conflict kind of as an example for us. So let's go ahead and jump into chapter 4 of Galatians, verse 21. So Paul says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So what he's going to do is he's going to use an Old Testament example to point them to the New Testament truth. So verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondwoman, that's Hagar. The other by a free woman, that's, who is it? Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. So the flesh and this promise or the spirit, that's the picture that, uh, that Paul is beginning to paint about Sarah and Hagar. So, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants. So, in your Bible, you have two covenants, right? It's the old and the new, right? And sometimes we call them testaments. This is kind of what he's talking about. So, there's two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So uh, this is a little, like a, a little bit of the theological meat. So we'll kind of like cut it up in little pieces so we can kind of chew on this. But what he's saying is Hagar is like Mount Sinai. If you remember, if you went to, you know, have some Bible knowledge, you went to Sunday school or something. What was given on Mount Sinai? The Ten Commandments, right? The law, the Ten Commandments. So God gives a law on the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. The children of Israel get them from Moses, and then Moses takes them to the promised land into Jerusalem. So what he's saying is, he's like, Hagar, the law, that picture is Mount Sinai and the earthly Jerusalem. That's the, that's the, the flesh, the, the way to relate to God through law, and it's a bondage. It's bondage. But, verse 26, but the Jerusalem above, now we're talking like Revelation, the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that is above, the spiritual place, is free. So one bondage, one free, like Sarah. So Sarah is the picture of the new Jerusalem. And then he says, which is the mother of us all. It's kind of interesting because a lot of times you hear like, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons, right? You know that whole thing. But here Paul is saying, well, so did Sarah. (laughs) So yes, Abraham had many sons, but Sarah actually was the wife of promise. And so she is the mother of us all in that way. Now, verse 27 is kind of interesting. He's, he, he's going to kind of, a little bit out of left field, bring in a quote from Isaiah chapter 54. So Isaiah 54, God is speaking, and Paul is going to quote. We're going to kind of explain this quote because it's kind of an interesting dynamic. It says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Kind of a strange verse. What is he talking about? So what he's saying is, Isaiah at the time was speaking to the the Jews going into exile. They were being punished by God for their sin and rebellion. They were kicked out of the land and they went to Babylon in exile. Okay, that's that's a really, you know, big biblical theme. The exile in Babylon. Daniel was in Babylon, Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra. That's that whole time frame, all right? So the Jews, they get exiled to Babylon, and they feel desolate. They feel hopeless. They're barren because of their sin and their rebellion. They, they don't have life. They're 
kicked out of the land. They're separated from kind of the, the promises of God. But Sarah also is barren. So there's, there's, different, there's like several levels to this promise that are kind of interesting. One, the children of Israel in exile, feeling desolate and barren. But two, Sarah feeling barren and desolate, right? Because of her inability. She can't have a child. And so she is hopeless. She is in this barren state. And so Paul's talking about this, the Jews, this, Sarah, but also us. We are desolate. We are hopeless. We have the inability to produce life. We are under the bondage of our sin and rebellion, and we can't, we can't live in the promises of God. So this, this verse kind of encapsulates all of us in our hopelessness, separated from God, inability to keep the law, um, not having a relationship with God on our own. Like, I can't do it. I'm, I'm barren. I'm desolate. But the, the interesting thing is he, he says, rejoice, break forth and shout. Why would the barren break forth and shout? Because though, though the Israelites weren't able, God was able. Though Sarah wasn't able, God was able. Though we are not able, God is able. So I rejoice that God is able. I don't rejoice that I am able. I, they weren't rejoicing. God spoke to them, and we looked at this also in Isaiah before, you know, that God has given them a future and a hope, right? That God gives them a future and a hope, even in exile. And God gives Sarah a promise, and that promise is also a future and a hope for her of having a child. And for us, God gives us a future and a hope. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes, sometimes I've gotten to the, I will say this, I've gotten to the place where I kind of like it when I don't have control. I kind of like it when it's completely out of my hands. I, I've just, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, you, you put the application in and it's out of your hands. You know, you had the conversation and it's out of your hands. You're just praying through this. It's out of your, like, I just, I don't know. Like, I love when I feel like I can't screw it up, <laughs> right? Like, I, I can't mess this up. It's God's. And that's really so much of our lives we think are in our control, but really aren't. And, and so I can rejoice. I can rejoice that it's not like, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Like the little engine that, what is that? The could, Yes. Like, we teach our little kids that, like, don't give up and all. That's great. But in relation to God, you can't. <laughs> I think I could. I can't. <laughs> I think I can. I can't. <laughs> like, I can't. I can't. I can't measure up. I can't fulfill the law. I'm imperfect. I'm broken. What do I need? I need another engine. <laughs> I need another engine that I can connect to that's going to pull me up that hill. And that's the gospel. That's Christ. And so, verse 28 Paul says, now we, brethren, brothers and sisters, now we, family of God, as Isaac was our children of promise. Isaac was the child of promise, and that's who we are. We are the children of promise. So that's our first point this morning, if you're taking notes. We are children of promise. We are children of promise, not children of performance. I'm a child of promise. What's the promise? The promise of God. I live in the promises of God. I'm a child of promise. There's a dynamic of I'm a child of promise, like I have a future and a hope, and, and I have the promises of God that he has made in Scripture. And both of those are powerful truths. That is your identity. You are a child of promise, not a child of performance. It's not how good you are. It's not how you keep the rules. It's how good God is and how God has paid the price and how God has made a way. I am a child of promise. Uh, let's actually, let's, let's say that together. <clears throat> Clear your voice a little bit. Here we go. Ready? We're going to say we are, a child, we are children of promise. Ready? 
We are children of promise. I want you to like say it like you mean it. We are children of promise. That's who we are. That is your identity. You may have other things that you think is your identity, but in Christ, we are children of promise. The law is for those who can keep it. None of us can keep it. So we live by the promises of God. I was listening to a podcast this week, and they were talking about this, this man was telling his testimony. He's a pastor, and he had gone through like panic attacks and depression, and he was really struggling. And one of the process, it was a multi-layered process, but one of the parts was for him just to like to know and 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 bathe in the promises of God. And I will say that is a great prescription. That is a great prescription for you and I is I don't know, look them in your in the Bible that you have, Google them, whatever it takes. Like Look at the promises of God and realize that you are a child of promise. Those promises are yours in Christ. And those promises give life in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And that is a promise of God. And that's the identity that we have in his promises. So now he goes on in verse 29. And he's going to talk a little bit about the conflict Because if you remember before, there's Isaac and Ishmael, and there was conflict. In fact, Ishmael was mocking Isaac. He was laughing at him, making fun of him. We kind of talked about it, if you remember, like that brother, sister, or that brother, younger brother, older brother kind of thing. Like, making fun of your little brother. If you had a brother, you know this happens. Either you did it or you received it, one of the way or the other. But there's a conflict between Isaac and Ishmael. But now he's going to make a spiritual application to this conflict. It wasn't just brotherly conflict. It was a dynamic of the different fruit, the flesh and the spirit. So look at verse 29. But as he who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. That key phrase is, even so it is now. What is now? What is now? Persecution from the flesh. Persecution from the legalist. Persecution from the law keeper against the grace receiver. What he's saying is these Judaizers, these people that were coming in, driving the Galatians back to the law, keeping the law, being circumcised, observing days. You got to do this. You got to do this. He's like, listen, that's just like Ishmael and Isaac. It's just like Ishmael and Isaac. And like, as we said at the beginning, that is still an issue for us. Legalism often drives people away from a real relationship with God. It limits us in the enjoyment of our relationship with God when it's in us. And I'm going to tell you, it is. Remember I talked about conflict and clues? We're going to talk about some clues. And I'm probably going to get you. (laughs) I'm going to get you somewhere or another because Jesus gets us all. Because all of us, we just have this little legalist, this little lawyer inside our hearts and minds. And he like kind of sneaks around and he comes out every once in a while. He's like, you shouldn't do that. And oh, you should do this. And that, they're watching you. It's in there. And so what, what I want to do is I'm going to go through some of the things that Jesus said so that we can get rid of that guy. <laughs> so we can be free and not have the bondage of religious legalism. So when we talk about the conflict, though, I want to give you a couple pictures because you may be like, well, what's the conflict? Grace and the law. Don't they kind of work together? They only work one way together. Every other way is conflict. And I'll show you what that looks like. And maybe you can identify with this. Do you remember the parable of Jesus telling about the landowner? And he's hired some people to do some work. He's like, listen, I'll pay you, you know, I'll give you 20 bucks. Come in, you know, work in my yard. So this guy early in the morning, he gets hired 20 bucks, work in my yard. He tells, hey, come work in my yard. I'm going to pay you 20 bucks. I'm going to pay you 20 bucks. Tells everybody they're going to pay the same thing. End of the day, they start paying. 
and he starts with the guys he hired at the end of the day, right? Are you with me? Right? So the guy gets 20 bucks. So what is the guy that got hired in the morning and is working all day? What is he thinking? I'm going to get more. I deserve more. I should get more. So as it's coming across, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks. I've been here since 8 a.m., 20 bucks. Who was the unhappiest person in the room? The person that's been working all day. And he's like, what the heck is the problem? I've been working my tail off, and this guy got 20 bucks? And the landowner is like, the problem is actually you. Your heart is the problem. Why aren't you just stoked for this guy? Why is it about you? I told you I'd give you 20 bucks, and I did. So why are you, why you griping about this guy? When we have been working, we don't like grace. <laughs> right? I don't want you to get grace. Like, oh, this guy gives his life to Christ at the end of his life, and he gets to go to heaven, and I've been working my butt off in church every Sunday, sacrificing, not watching football. Like, I didn't sleep with my girlfriend my whole time in high school, and I've lived a good life, and this guy's going to go to heaven too? Right? Prodigal son, you know the story? The, who's the unhappy person in the prodigal star, son story? It's the guy who stayed there working, right? He, his, his, the, the son goes, he spends his money, he comes back, he's broken, he's messed up his life. His father rejoices because the son returns. And he runs out and he's like, kill the fatted calf and here's my ring and here's my robe and I'm so happy to see you. Let's, it's a party. And who's the unhappy person? Who's the party pooper? <laughs> the party pooper is the other brother. He's like, Listen, Dad, I've been working the whole time. I never got a party. And he's like, son, he was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. Let's just rejoice. See, the problem, that, that story, the problem is the heart of the other brother. It's not like don't be a prodigal. It's don't be an older brother. When God is gracious, rejoice. That's why Isaiah is saying, rejoice, oh you barren. Like, you don't have anything, just rejoice. If I'm gracious, rejoice. Let me be gracious to whom I'm going to be gracious. But sometimes we've been working hard, we've been sacrificing, and we think we deserve more. And grace looks too easy. It looks too soft. They need to do something. <laughs> you know, make some, you got to do some work. Got to do something hard. And God's like, it's hard enough to follow me. <laughs> Just receive my grace. Right? It's a challenge to follow Christ. But it's a blessing. And it's grace that saves us. Some people think even that grace is dangerous. I've had people, you know, tell me, like, don't, 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 don't talk about grace because they're going to do stupid stuff and they're going to blow it and they're going to sin on purpose. If they know I can, I, I can do whatever I want and then be forgiven, then they're going to do whatever they want and we want to control them. We want to manipulate them, right? That's what people think religion is. Oftentimes, it's just manipulation, social control. And a lot of religion is, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is about a relationship with Christ. Jesus came to die and do the work on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven and accepted in the beloved. It's not about social control. It's about personal relationship with God and the purpose why you've been created. So really, the danger isn't grace. The danger is the religious legalist. That's one of the big dangers in the church because the religious legalist will constantly oppose grace. Well, let's not give that for free. Let's make him pay for it. Well, let's not do that. Let's make it a little harder. Well, let's make sure they sign. Well, if they're going to do that, then they have to qualify for this. <laughs> it's... They don't want grace, they want work. 
Now, there is a time to do work. But if you remember we've talked about before, the time to do work is after you receive grace, not in order to receive grace. And, and the, the order of that is so key. So when Jesus was talking in his day, in Matthew chapter 23, he had the strongest things to say to the religious legalists, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. You see, everyone thought, like, these people are the most spiritual people alive. And Jesus said, those guys are dead. Everybody thought, like, they seem so spiritual, but they were actually so fleshly. They seemed so holy, but they were actually so haughty. They seemed to have such vision and Jesus would say they were actually blind, right? They seemed like they were the example to follow, but Jesus said they are an example, but don't follow them. And the truth is, is that we can all, we can all get into that kind of path. We can all kind of slide into that because it's, it's a very natural process to do. It's a very natural process to become ritualistic, legalistic, you know, I got to do these things and all of that. So here's our second point this morning. Our second point is this. We need to guard against religiosity. We need to guard against religiosity. So we're going to take a little walk through Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read it to you, the New Living Translation, because I think it really reads conversationally well. And I just want you to, I, I want you to like kind of let the Lord and the Spirit of God just kind of look into your heart. And if there's in a little, pe- little places, let them take it away. Let them sweep it up. Let them clean it up. If you feel convicted, it's only because God wants to set you free, not make you feel bad. He wants to set you free. So Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 seven clues. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, notice who he's talking to, crowds and disciples. He's not actually at this moment talking to the Pharisees. Why? He's warning people not to listen to them. He's like, listen, I'm going to tell you about these scribes and Pharisees. And he's, he's talking to the crowds. He's talking to his disciples. He says, verse 2, the, religi- the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. So here's our first, here's our first clue. They say the right thing, but they don't do it. That is the, like, that's the classic legalist, religious kind of thing. I'll tell you what to do all day, but I don't actually do it myself, right? That's an easy way, like, here's the list, here's the thing, follow it, but I don't do it. He's saying, you can listen to them because they're teaching some truth, but don't follow them because they're not living it, and that's a dangerous place. Verse 4. He says, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Is that a crazy picture? They crush people with unbearable religious demands. So here's the clue. They give heavy burdens, but they don't help people. They give heavy burdens, but they don't help people. That's what we're called to do, is to help people. That's part of being a believer is helping people. And yet, all they do is heavy burdens. Okay, you, you have a problem? Here's a list. You have an issue? Here's a thing. You, you have a, a concern? Do this. Burden, burden, burden. Right? Can I get some help with that? No, just do this. <laughs> Here, here's that. Here's this. Have you done that yet? There are things to do. Sometimes we need to do. But it's the order that we do them and how we do them and really the why. 
the why. You ever, you ever had a kid who just keeps asking why? Right? Why? Why? Kind of drives you nuts. Do that. Do that with yourself. Why am I doing this? Why am I saying that? Is it just a heavy burden? Or am I really trying to help? So verse 5, everything they do is for show. <laughs> Think about that one. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. Then they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they love to sit at the head of table, at the head um, at the head table, at banquets, and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi, which is teacher. Right? Here's the clue. They like the attention from people, but they don't love people. That's a legalist. They love or like the attention from people, but they don't love people. Right? I... You know, I've, I'm doing everything to be seen. Everything is a show. Like, oh, so-and-so's, you know, near, so I'm just going to lift my hands a little higher and look more spiritual. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear a shirt with a bigger verse on it or a bigger bumper sticker than everybody else. I carry a bigger Bible. Whatever it is, I just do it for show. I, I just do it so people see something. We've talked, just literally, it's funny because sometimes when you hear these things, you're like, yeah, why, why are we, Deborah and I were talking the other day, and she's like, oh, are we still talking about legalism? <laughs> I was like, yes, we are still talking, because Paul's still talking about it. But the truth is, we still are dealing with it. I've had conversations in the last couple weeks with people and there's still elements of legalism in our hearts and lives. There's still things that we do. And it's like, well, I do that for a spiritual show. We talked about the fact that I teach from a laptop. My scripture is in the laptop. The verses are there. But maybe I should bring a Bible up and just put it up here. For show. <laughs> right? That's a real, con we just had this conversation the other day, we were talking about that, how it's like, oh, I'm going to, like, well, I always make sure, and, and fine, maybe you have a good reason why, but is it just, like, are you doing things for show? That's, that's a legalist, or are you doing it because you love people? That's what the Lord does, he loves people, so I do things because I love people, not because I'm a legalist. Not because I want the attention. So verse 13, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees. Now he's kind of getting more direct at them. Hypocrites, fakes is what he's saying. For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. Have you ever had the door shut in your face? Anybody? Ever had the door shut in your face? It's like so humiliating, right? Even if it's an accident, you're like starting to go and then the door just shuts. You're like, oh. And then if you try the door and it's locked, you feel even more stupid, <laughs> right? You're like, ah. He's like, you're shutting the door. You, why, what does that mean? You can't come in here. You're not special enough. You're not good enough, right? VIP entrance only. You are out. <laughs> That's what the Pharisees like to do. They like to they like to make it exclusive. So here's our next clue. They are exclusive, but they are also disconnected. They're like, hey, you're not good enough. You can't come in here. You're not welcome here. You don't wear the right clothes. You don't act the right way. You don't vote the right way. You don't fill in what, you don't like the right sex. You're not welcome. I close the door. But I'm also disconnected. You see, they're closing the door. Jesus said, you close the door for others so they can't come in and deal with their sin. They can't come in and have their lives changed. They can't come in and really know who I am. You close the door on them, but you've closed it on yourself. 
you also are disconnected. And there's times where we make it exclusive, but we also become disconnected. The Spirit of God is quenched because of my exclusion and pride with other people. And so it's not love and compassion that comes out. It's disconnection and short-tempered and irritation, right? He's like, they're exclusive, but they're also disconnected. Verse 15, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice he's going to say this several times. Verse 15, for why? What do they do? For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. <laughs> you think that's a tough one? <laughs> right? <laughs> you come up for prayer, and, and the, the pastor's like, listen, you are a child of hell. <laughs> like, oh, sorry. <laughs> what is he talking about? He's like, these people work so hard to convert people. They work so hard to like come to my side, get my insight, know the deeper truth, follow these things. They work so hard to make a convert, but they're not converting them to Christ. They're not converting him to a real relationship with God. They're just converting him to a burden, to a legalism that leads to hell. These people don't have a relationship with God. These Pharisees that he's talking about, they crucified Christ. They lied and schemed and paid people off to kill Jesus. And they were the religious people. Like when you're like, man, I just don't like those religious people. Neither does he. And yet that's in us. So what do we do with it? Like confess it. We get rid of it. He, he points it out. And we're like, I want to be free of that. I knew somebody like this. When I was in Bible college, there was a guy, and he worked really hard to get converts. But it, he wasn't going out into the town to share Christ. He was going within the school and being like, hey, come, in, come into my, he had a library. I think it was in his basement, of all things. Come down to my basement. You could see true scriptural, doctrinal truth, the, deep theological thinking. I, I knew several people that got sucked into that. And very rarely did I see someone come out with good fruit. Very rarely did somebody join that little group and have more love or have more joy or have more peace or have more patience. The exact opposite was happening. Now, frankly, <laughs> I was just more concerned with going out with Deborah. So I never got stuck into that. But a lot of people did. And it was unfortunate. And for, for some of them, it was hard to get out of. But that's what a legalist does. They make converts, but they don't follow God. They're making converts, but they don't follow God. They're not actually following God. They're just following their doctrinal viewpoint or their theological position. There are legalistic rules and what you have to do and how you have to do it, what you have to believe and how you have to believe it. They're missing, they're missing the mark there. So let's slide down a little farther, verse 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? Same thing again and again. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes. Do not neglect the more, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides. You strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. So the Pharisees would literally like take a strainer, pour their water through it so that no unclean gnats would get in their water. Now... I don't think that's a bad idea, right? Nobody wants to drink a gnat. You ever seen that little bug floating on the top and you're like, try to get it out of there? That's not the point. The point is, you, you're, you're worried about these little tiny things, but you're missing these big things. Like, you follow the religious rules and you, you know, tithe your 
from your herb garden. Okay, I, I have, you know, like all these little bushes that make all the herbs. And so like nine seeds for you, for me, and then one seed for God. I'm tithing my 10% of every little thing. That's how religious I am. He's like, yeah, tithe. Yes, please give. But don't forget to give the bigger things. Like give mercy, give grace, give justice. It's like you're so caught up on these little tiny things. But you're missing the big thing. Like think of the things that you think you have to do to please God. Think, think of them. Are they minor? Are they minor? <laughs> are they minor? I don't know what that means. Are they minor? Or are they major? Are, do you spend more time thinking about the spiritually minor things or the spiritually major things? Because here's our next clue. They major on the minors, but they totally forget the majors. They major on the minors, but they totally forget the majors. Keep the big thing the big thing. The other things are fine and good, but, but you can't forget this. It's like, you know, let's just, let's make it like more, I'll think of one example. I want you guys to come up with a few. Let's see if we can come up with three things that are religious things that we're supposed to or we think we're supposed to do. I'll, I'll go with one. Um, supposed to go to church every Sunday. Now, I really appreciate that you guys show up. I really do. It's a big room, and I'd be lonely. So I love that you come to hear God's word. I, I love that. But if you think that coming every Sunday in this ritualistic, religious kind of expectation is going to make God happy or make you a better, you know, standing with God, you're wrong. But sometimes we make that, like, okay, I'm going to go to church every Sunday. And every Sunday, I yell at everybody in my family. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I think love. I think patience. I think joy. <laughs> like, I gotta, I mean, that, that hits home for me. If, if you got hit, you know, <laughs> same. Right? Like, I'm, I'm going to do this, but I, miss, I forgot, like, the most important thing. Like, I, I need to love my neighbor. That's a... So let's, let's have like a, a little bit of give and take. What do you think is some religious rule or expectation that people think you're supposed to do? What do you think? Call them out. It's only me by myself. Call me out. Like what, what are you going to do? Read your Bible every day. What? Tithe. Pray before food. Right? Like, okay, so there's a, a few things. And I think like, all right, I'm going to like... I don't know if you've ever done this, but you go to have lunch, out to lunch with somebody. It's not a church person, so you just go like, oh, God bless my food. Or it is a church person, and you want to make sure that they know that you're, so, or maybe it's a pastor, and so you go into like praying for missionaries and every other thing that you can think of, <laughs> right? It's like, I'm, I'm just, I, if you pray or not pray before your food, are you loving the person you're eating with? <laughs> right? Like, that's the major thing. A minor thing maybe is like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pray before my food. Fine. Great. But am I loving the people that are around me? Am I, am I, do I, is the, you know, the most conversation we have is when we pray and then we're just eating in silence. Like those are the those are the things. Read my Bible every day. I read my Bible every day. Every day I read a chapter. Oh, yesterday I didn't quite finish the chapter. Every day I read for 30 minutes. But yesterday I only read for 26 minutes. Tomorrow I'm gonna add four minutes because I, I gotta I gotta get that 30 minutes. <laughs> How about do you remember what you read? How about read a verse and live it? Right, like that's the, that's the struggle for us is like we get caught up in these little tiny things, distracted by the littles, and then we forget the bigs, the, the majors. That's what he was saying was happening with the Pharisees. Like, man, you're worried about a gnat and you're eating a camel. It's an unclean animal. It's a big one. Verse 25, we'll scoot down a little bit. Verse 25, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, Remember, a hypocrite is a person that wears a mask or a fake, an actor. 
For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. Here's our last clue. They care about the outward, but they give little attention to the inward. If you find yourself more concerned about the outside than the inside, you've got a little legalist running around in your heart. (laughs) Right? You've got somebody that's like, hey, you know, better be careful, better watch out. People are going to see this. People are going to know this. Verse 28 He says, Jesus says, outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, what happens a lot of times is that instead of inward repentance, I just have outward avoidance. Instead of inward repentance, I have outward avoidance. I I stop, you know, outwardly being hateful, but I'm inwardly malicious. I stopped outwardly being sexually immoral, but I'm inwardly lustful. I stopped outwardly being a gossip, but I'm just now inwardly judgmental. And it's like when you, you ever have something in your house that needs to get cleaned up, and instead of cleaning up, you just move it from one place to another? I have a stack of papers, like some cards and some different things. And Deborah and I have moved them around the house. Like, I, she doesn't like them over here, moves them over there. I move them over here. Instead of, a, you know, the, you got the pile of clothes, and instead of on the couch, now they're on the chair. I don't know. Is this getting real for anybody in the garage? Instead of, like, actually just cleaning it up, I just move it. And that's what we do sometimes spiritually. And instead of actually coming to God and asking, just forgive me, just cleanse me, just work in my dirty little heart, please. We're like, oh, God, no, I'm good, I'm fine, yeah, everything's great. He's like, why don't you just let me clean that up? No, no, it's fine, it's clean, let me just slide it over there. You didn't see that? You didn't see that? It's like, we become like the kid with the chocolate on their face, you know? Did you eat a cookie? No, didn't eat a cookie, you got chocolate all over your face. God's like, I can see your heart. <laughs> I already know. And it's the, it's the religiosity that drives people away. It's the religiosity that, like, that keeps us in bondage. It's the religiosity that God just wants to get rid of. I was listening to uh, an interview, Terry Crews. He's an actor, um, big, strong guy. He was, played football and got into acting, and he was... He was sharing his testimony and how he really had a very difficult upbringing in the church. How they were, you know, very Pentecostal, very religious, and and very dysfunctional and difficult to live in. And the interviewer, uh, he actually, at one point he was like, man, it's kind of, it's like miraculous that you still are walking with the Lord, that you still come to church. And he's like, you know, I realized the problem wasn't God. The problem were just people. <laughs> His people were, were, were broken. And he was like, you know, all kinds of rules. Like, you can't dance. Um, you know, you can't drink. Uh, you can't go to the movies. Um, you can't play sports. All of these things. Like, we'd go to the church for like, he's like, we'd go to church for hours and hours. And yet the pastor was dealing drugs. And they could go, they couldn't go to the movie theater, but they could watch the movie at their house. And he's like, why? Why can't we, why can't we go to the movie theater and we just have to watch it in our house? Well, I have an idea. You want, probably? Because who, people see you at the movie theater, right? And so we're always worried about like, well, well, well I'll watch it at Netflix, but I'm not going to the theater. <laughs> and, and that became a problem for him because there's a disconnect it doesn't make sense. And so as a kid, he was always like, why? Why? And his parents were like, because I said. <laughs> That's not a reason. So verse 30. He will wrap up here with our last point, our last couple of verses. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So if you remember, Ishmael was cast out. That's how they dealt with the issue. The persecution, the problem, the difficulty. God said, yeah, it's time for Ishmael and Hagar to go. And God took care of them, but they needed to leave. And the, and the point of, this, of the analogy is this. You can't mix the flesh with the faith. You can't mix the works of the law with the, the, the work of the Spirit. You can't mix them. You have to stop. You have to cast it out. So our third and final point is this. We need to stop, not add. We need to stop, not add. Don't add legalism. Don't add the law. Don't be like, okay, now I'm a Christian. Now I'm going to follow these 10 rules. And, you know, now I'm going to do this and that. And I got to do that. No, don't, don't add. Just stop. Stop listening to legalists, the one in your own head and whoever else, right? Stop listening to legalists. Stop adding works of the law for your acceptance. God accepts you already in Christ. Don't add to it. And then stop adding works of the law, hoping for heart change. The law doesn't change hearts. Rules don't change hearts. More to-dos don't change your heart. Okay, so what changes my heart? God. The kindness of God. The word of God. The love of God. The truth of God. Like, that's what changes from the inside. And that's what sets us free. And so our last verse is this. Verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And here, here's the thing. Stand fast. Stand fast in the liberty. You see, the liberty, the freedom of Christ is in the promises of God. It's the promises of God that I stand in. So stand. To, to stand fast means it's firm, fixed, and settled. And the promises of God are firm, fixed, and settled. Your own performance isn't. Your own performance isn't firm, fixed, and settled. Right? It's up and down with the weather, with your emotions, with your feelings, with, with your hormones, with your, whether you ate or not today. Like, all of these things. But, but you can stand fast in the liberty. In the liberty of the gospel. And the liberty of the promises of God. We are children of promise. And there is great freedom. Let's go ahead and stand as we close this morning. We're going to close in a song of worship. And I just want you to be reminded. As we stand, I want you to be reminded to stand fast in faith. In grace. Abraham is the father of faith. And I heard one commentator said, Sarah is the type of grace. And so faith and grace come together and they give us life and they give us freedom.